This is the faculty colloquium for January 22nd. And uh, I am presenting, <coughs> excuse me, a draft paper that I uh, presented uh, this past fall at a conference, a non-lawyer conference, and I am now updating and expanding for submission to a law journal. So comments on the paper, on the presentation, are, of course, always appreciated. Um, the title of the paper and the presentation today, Flawed Transparency, Shared Data Collection, and Disclosure Challenges for Google Glass and Similar Technologies. Uh, as met, some of you may know, I recently acquired Google Glass in part, in large part, to do this kind of privacy research. So, all right. Okay. Uh, if you have not yet downloaded the paper, you can download it from ezor.org slash paper see what was the conference. Just a, a brief overview uh, on the relevant privacy laws here. Privacy technology frequently paired in discussion and thought in lots of different industries. Uh, we are seeing that as technology is embedded in so much of our daily lives, the privacy issues start uh, coming for in construction, talking about smart grid and uh, being able to monitor power use in finance. We've certainly all seen recently with Target and Neiman Marcus, I'm told, uh, that there were data breaches. Uh, transportation, whether it's your Easy Pass or your Easy Pay Metro card or your car the, or any vehicle uh, being monitored, uh, your identity issues. The right to privacy is actually a term that came out of a late 19th century Harvard Law Review article. I think it's actually in the first edition of the Harvard Law Review uh, by future Justice Brandeis and Warren, uh, which in fact was driven, their thoughts on why we need a legal right to privacy were driven largely by the new technologies of the time, specifically photography, candid photography, and uh, wide distribution of newspapers and media. Privacy and technology are often raised in the context of anonymity. The ability to be anonymous, the right to be anonymous, the ability to be pseudonymous, and the limits on that, both legally and technologically. Why are we focusing on privacy now and we didn't as much 30, 40, 50 years ago? Because with computers, with digital storage, with digital networks, the ability to access, to copy, to transmit, and to change personal information and to monitor behavior remotely have become so much more prevalent, uh, so much easier, so much less expensive, that suddenly these issues are much more important to a wider audience. So we have both law and practice protecting privacy. Um, the laws that are promulgated, certainly uh, in the business context, but also in the personal context, largely concerned with two aspects of privacy. Personal information, personally identifiable information, uh, and behavior monitoring. Different cultures have different structures for defining privacy as well as for protecting it. Uh, and with technology, you can both infringe on privacy and protect it. In the United States, uh, we are primarily a self-regulatory regime. That is, we do not have a national data privacy law. We have state laws, uh, but on a federal level, we have laws about particular categories of information and categories of users, but overall the process under federal law is generally self-regulation, trusting businesses to do the right thing, to disclose what they are doing, to obtain informed consent before collecting, using, and sharing personal information or monitoring behavior. The, some of the statutes, uh, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act is a federal statute. There are privacy and security rules that I think we've all been exposed to uh, under the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. 
the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Financial Modern Modernization Act of 1999 also brought with it financial privacy and security laws and regulations that apply. But again, these specific categories, you also have government information, you have uh, tax and financial information, the Fair Credit Reporting Act for credit information. We do have these sectoral laws and regulations. But overall, we're talking a self-regulatory regime. And for those who are more familiar, perhaps, with the securities laws context, it's somewhat similar in that the essential concept here is disclosure. That just as the Securities Act of 33, the Securities and Exchange Act of 34, have uh, they established and have maintained a requirement for initial and ongoing disclosure by publicly traded firms and other companies for investors in order that the markets uh, should be driven by as full information as possible. And just as those laws and their regulations provide liability for failing to disclose or for inaccurate disclosure, 10B5, Rule 10b-5's material misstatements or omissions standard, Although we don't always have specific statutory focus on privacy, it is very much the same idea of tell us, tell the consumer what you are doing, tell the consumer honestly, and then do what you've said. And if you don't, or if you haven't acted properly, there may be liability under other legal regimes. Uh, and primarily those legal regimes, and I'll get into it in a minute, come out of consumer protection and the broad jurisdiction of state and federal consumer protection bodies to protect consumers, to look at business practices and decide whether they are unfair or deceptive. And that alone can provide jurisdiction for those agencies to act. So that's the sort of general meta-legal framework. But what are the best practices? What are the principles underlying data privacy? Well, there are a number of sets of these principles published by various bodies, various governments, but they're fairly similar in their, in their coverage. They, they hit pretty much the same thing, and they are generally called sets of fair information practice principles, or FIPS. So if you hear a, pr a privacy person talking about FIPS, uh, this is what that person is, is talking about. There are statements of best practices and ideals. Multiple versions. Uh, we see these. There are early versions uh, in the 1970s. But probably among the simplest and most direct is that in uh, the FTC's 1998 report to Congress on uh, online privacy. And these are the categories that are laid out in that FTC report in terms of fair information practice principles. The first is notice and awareness, that the business should provide notice, accurate notice, to consumers of what the business is doing with regard to personal information. Uh, and that that notice then generates awareness on the part of consumers. Choice and consent obviously very closely tied to notice. Are consumers given the choice once they are informed? Have they been informed properly? And are they able to make that a choice whether or not to share information, whether or not to authorize specific uses of information? Um, hold on, I just have to click some things here. Uh, this is why I need a, OK. Um, so after the choice and consent, we have access and participation. What happens once that information is collected, once the consumer ostensibly has consented? Is the consumer able to see what has been collected after the fact? Is the consumer able to update it, to change that information, to correct it, uh, to Revoke consent. That's access and participation. And these are principles. Best, ideally, yes, there will be access. There will be participation. Integrity and security. That's a, a burden on the data collector to make sure that the data, once they're collected, uh, are kept securely 
both electronically and physically, and that they are protected from alter undue alteration, that they are protected because people rely on these data, that they should be stored in a way and processed in a way that keeps them accurate, keeps them intact. And what if they're not? Well, one of the principles is enforcement and redress, that the consumer, having provided information, if there are problems, if there are errors, um, that the consumer has redress either internally or externally. Yes, Meredith, you have a question. Are you going to, uh, Meredith, we're not hearing you. If you cannot, if, if we can't hear you, you can ask your question in the chat, please. Okay, yeah, the, so the example of the data being collected, uh, very specifically, this is really focusing on personally identifiable information. Data that specifically identify a unique individual. That can be obviously a name, uh, an address, a telephone number, social security number or other identifying number like a driver's license. But it can be things that you wouldn't necessarily think about as personally identifiable, uniquely identifiable. Hair color, on it by itself, probably not, but depends on the on the population. Um, if you, and if you combine a number of types of data that by themselves would not uh, indicate a particular person, given the population, you can narrow it down. There's uh, back in, I think it was 2007, I, I will provide the link, uh, AOL briefly released a set of uh, its search queries the entire database of its search queries from its users. And AOL de-identified those search queries. They took all the names out, but they identified each person by a number. And so that same number, any of the queries that had come from, any of the searches that had come from that person would have the same number attached to them. Within a day, New York Times reporters had looked through these data had pulled out a particular number and based on what she had searched for, were able to put, identify her and confirm that in fact she was the one who had searched for it. Uh, I have the article, I just don't have it handy. But that's, I raised that to point out that even non, she didn't search for her own name necessarily, but for where she lived and health for someone her age and pet issues and they said, okay, how can we find someone in this area who has a pet, who is the right age, et cetera, and they very quickly came to this particular person. So to your point, to your question, Meredith, personal information can be really any of these things. And the idea is that before a business collects, uses, and shares that information, that the user is informed about it, is given the opportunity to consent, is given the opportunity to participate and get access, uh, that the, is protected, those data are protected, and that if there's a problem, the user, the individual has some redress, some recourse. Um, so how do we implement these in the self-regulatory world, especially on online? We have what are called privacy policies, although the privacy pros out there will say they're actually privacy notices. Uh, and what they do is describe the policy of the organization. They're, these are disclosure documents, pure and simple. And they are generally on the bottom of website pages. There is no federal requirement, generally speaking, for them other than, again, for particular sectors of the economy or sectors of information. California, though, does require all website, all businesses with websites doing business in California to have privacy policies and given 
how large a market California is and the likelihood that any particular business of size will have some exposure in California, either itself or through its customers. Generally speaking, most businesses read that as a, a de facto requirement to put privacy policies on their websites. So what is it? It's a, so what is a policy? What, is, what are these disclosure documents? It's a statement of the organization's actual collection, use, and sharing of personally identifiable information. Um, best practices say they, these, this statement should be prominently available. As I said, there's a requirement in California law. Interestingly, Pennsylvania does not require a privacy policy, but in its consumer protection law specifically defines a misstatement, a material misstatement, a knowing material misstatement in, its, in a privacy policy as a specific consumer protection offense. It's not general liability, it's actually a specific offense in Pennsylvania law. Um, and as I say, the issue with federal law is have you been honest and have you properly treated consumer data? Uh, while the FTC in its enforcement started looking at disclosures and whether there are omissions and misstatements uh, over the last approximately decade, a little bit less, we've seen a number of FTC enforcement actions, a growing number, where there were no misstatements but there were lax security practices and that was seen as an unfair trade practice that also falls under Section 5 of the FTC Act. Um, Challenges for privacy policy, accuracy, revisions, method of delivery, can they be put properly in place? Uh, with, when you've got a full website, it's easy enough. Um, but if you've got an app and it's this big and you don't really have a click on anything, how do you present the user with the privacy policy? If they're buying something online, how do you do that then? What if there are multi par multiple parties involved, a cell phone company and an operating system company and an app developer and so on? These are real challenges and with newer technologies, we have newer challenges. Which brings me to the subject of, the actual subject of my paper and of a lot of uh, my own thought and research and that has to do with Google. Now Google is a unique company. I, I would argue that it's probably unique in history. Um, what Google is, it's not unique in this, but it's unique in the scope. If you look at Google, how does it make its money? And you can look at its investment uh, documentation. Google makes its money by monetizing personal information collection. Now you may say, no, no, Google is a search engine company. It isn't. The search engine is a means by which Google uses the information it has collected to put up better targeted ads, better targeted searches, uh, and generate revenue primarily through that advertising. Uh, Google's other services are driven by information collection as well. And if you look, and I will talk in a moment about some of the acquisitions that Google has made, they don't make sense in the context of a search engine necessarily, but they absolutely make sense if you look at it from an information collection business. Uh, the number of businesses and the scope of businesses within Google is staggering. Uh, and many of them are not branded as Google businesses, so users may not know. Even before we get to technologies like Google Glass, there's a real challenge for a company, for Google specifically, to say, we are providing notice. We are getting informed consent because there is no good way to find out what Google owns. There, there is no complete list that I've been able to find. I've asked other people, um, and that list is constantly changing. And it's far, far beyond websites. And the information being collected uh, is far beyond personally identifiable. So a couple of examples. Um, we have Zagat's, some of you who go out to more restaurants and have more diversity of restaurants than do I. Very familiar, I would imagine, with the Zagat Guide. Uh, fondly, I, I remember that it was founded by two recovering Yale Law graduates, not in my class, but well before. Um, so we're familiar with the Zagat Guide. 
What people don't necessarily know is Zagat is a Google business and has been for a couple of years. And if you look at the Zagat privacy policy, note it is Google's privacy policy. So if you are if you use the Zagat guide online, excuse me, and you create an account with Zagats, you are linking to everything else you do with Google. Your information is being shared, is being paired. And so now, in addition to what you're searching for and other things, Google now knows your restaurant preferences. Even if you didn't use the Google search engine uh, to, to look for a restaurant. Now, you see at the top right there, it says Zagat Wine. I looked into this. It's actually a separate business. It is a standalone business uh, they've licensed. It's a wine seller that has licensed the Zagat name, which might give you a little comfort, except when you read its privacy policy, it's a licensing relationship. It is sharing personal information from its customers with the licensor, with Google. So now your wine preferences, as well as your dining preferences. Um, so that's sort of one a, one example that isn't necessarily obvious. Uh, it was announced a couple of weeks ago that Google has made a three billion with a B dollar cash offer for a company called Nest. Uh, I don't know if any of you has a Nest device. I don't, uh, mostly because my house is so old that um, it would be a complete waste of, of a thermostat. But these are da uh, data enabled, wired enabled, home monitoring and management devices. You see the Nest thermostat, uh, Nest Protect, carbon monoxide and smoke detectors. It's a young company, uh, has very well re regarded devices, and there's now a $3 billion offer on the, on the table from Google. Now, why would a search engine company purchase a thermostat and smoke detector company? Uh, the obvious answer is, and, and pay that much for it. I, certainly companies invest in all sorts of things. But $3 billion in cash suggests, even with Google's amount of cash that it has available, that this is a significant part of its business model. And if you think about the ability to potentially monetize um, utility use, right, protection, knowing who's getting baby monitors, knowing what kind of uh, HVAC systems have, you begin to see, and in fact, the large commentary about this proposed purchase has been about privacy and the current management Nest promising that oh, it will be kept separate and we're going to have people opt in, but that doesn't mean that new customers will be treated the same way as existing ones. Uh, same week that Nest was, the Nest thing was announced, uh, those of you who may be interested in cars may have seen the Open Automotive Alliance announced, I think, with the Detroit Auto Show. Technology and auto industry leaders committing to bringing the Android platform to cars starting in 2014. The Android platform is a free of charge operating system created by Google. And in fact, if you look at the partners, the members of the Open Automotive Alliance, Audi, General Motors, Honda, Hyundai Motor Group, uh, NVIDIA that does uh, visual chip processing, and Google. And suddenly, you begin to see all the ways that Google is collecting information. Now, Google is not new to the idea of collecting traffic information. We use, there are these Street View cars, some of you may have seen, that have been photographing locations around the world so that when you go to Google Maps, you can actually get a Street View. <laughs> Uh, they were also apparently sniffing Wi-Fi networks throughout uh, the world as they did what they're doing um, to the point where a number of, um, number of countries have brought lawsuits about them because they were not only noting the location of the Wi-Fi servers, they may in fact have been sniffing the traffic, the actual data going across these Wi-Fi servers. Um, and they are facing some significant legal issues. This was the rather dorky looking, uh, one of the dorky looking Google Maps Street View cars. There have been people walking around with backpacks. But if you have an, uh, an Android phone, you're already, or even any phone using Google location, you are also feeding data about the location of Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, and that, also, that brings me to Google Glass. Um, Google Glass, uh, I figured it would probably
it will open the camera. If anyone wants to see it, let me know. But it is essentially uh, a small computing device and a little camera and a little prism that works as your screen mounted on an eyeglass frame. And it really is a wearable sensor suite. It, it, uh, it's discreet, uh, particularly if you already wear glasses um, or you put the little sunglass frames uh, with which it comes in. Uh, it's wireless. It has wide to any local Wi-Fi hotspot or access point. It doesn't have a cellular modem yet, mostly because of their battery life. Uh, it does have Bluetooth, and it operates as a Bluetooth headset. And um, it has, I think, GPS, or it uses your phone's GPS, but it can do location. Um, it's a, essentially an Android device, although it doesn't look like Android. And even if the screen is a tiny little prism, and even for those of us with progressive eyeglasses where we don't see well up close, it is perfectly clear. It looks like a monitor about, hold on, this big in front of you. It's very, very clear, very easy to see. Um, it has cameras, front-facing camera, both video and still. It has microphones. I'm told an eye sensor so it can see what your eyes are doing. Uh, they've in recently used that to enable, although it doesn't work well, being able to snap a picture by winking your eye. Um, and so on. And so there are applications. It's not a cell phone, but it is a very capable and increasingly capable because of software wireless device. So what about the privacy issues? Well, it's got Wi-Fi. It's got a camera. It's got a microphone. It's got location sensors. It, it can do a lot of different things. And so what is it that the users are told about what it can do? Well, after since I wrote the paper in, in the fall, when I finished the paper, at that point I didn't have access to the Google Glass terms of sale because I didn't have the link. They weren't easily available. Well, once I got my own offer to buy it, I did and made a point of copying it. So these are this is a portion of the Google Glass terms of sale. Um, so you see there are different terms of service. Your use of any glass software or services that use Google Maps is also subject to the Google Maps term. Tells you not to uh, look at it while it's driving. Um, certain use of certain device features may require that you open a Google account. Okay, so you've got all these different potential sets of policies that apply to what is on the face of it, if you'll pardon the pun, a fairly simple interface. And here is what the Google Glass terms of sale say about privacy. Not much. Please refer to our Google privacy policy and the Google wallet privacy policy for more information on how Google collects uh, and uses and shares the information we receive from you. And I have a link there. Um, I highly commend to all of you, you look at Google's privacy policy because it, to see exactly how little it informs you about this multifaceted organization. Look at the second paragraph. You agree that in order to process your order and protect you and Google from fraudulent transactions, Google may provide, well, actually, Google may provide your order information to reputable third parties to perform address verifications and make deliveries. So that's at least the processing of the order. Um, whether that also includes software, it's an open question. It, but that they make sure to tell you everything else is a footnote. And like all good law review footnotes, there's a lot more to it than in the actual text. So this is glass. It's a wearable camera. That's not so new. Uh, it's a Bluetooth headset. Not new at all. People have been walking around with cameras for a long time. Uh, people have walked walking around with microphones for a long time. But there are a couple things that it is, and I think it is new. One is it's subtle. It's not unique in being subtle, but it is subtle. And there is no recording light, for example. You will read, if you've ever read a review of Google Glass, that when someone is recording you with Google Glass, a little red light goes on. This is not true. What they actually mean is that in front of the Glass user, 
you can see that the display, the little prism, is on, but you can't read it. All you see is a sort of vaguely orange, glowy rectangle. And that is seen as the recording light. Except there's a new app out there that allows you to record with the display off. So there's absolutely no notice. You may have seen recently, actually just the last day or two, someone was arrested, uh, questioned by the FBI in a movie theater for wearing Google Glass into the movie theater. And uh, he did it because he had gotten the prescription lenses to go with his Google Glass, and they were his glasses. And he said, well, it's off. We're not, I'm not recording. And that was apparently true. But there really is no good way to tell. Um, I think right now the only saving grace for Hollywood in that context is that you can't really record on current battery life more than about 40, 45 minutes, and it gets very, very warm doing it. Um, so there's, there are concerns about the recording. There's a concern about, you know, you read, oh, people are wearing glass into the bathroom. Uh, people are pulling out their cell phones in the bathroom as well. So there are those concerns, the voyeurism concerns. But I really am less focused on that because that, it's fairly obvious, and people have had hidden cameras and microphones for a very long time. I want to know what's going on in the upstream side. Um, the issue of what is Google, and for that matter, what are other companies collecting from Glass for their own uses, the kinds of things that should be disclosed in a privacy policy for the user, the wearer of Glass, um, because the people who are in front of the wearer of Glass don't deal directly with Google on that. Um, but they might be included. Imagine, and it really is not difficult to imagine, that in order to increase the power of its facial recognition software, which it does have, uh, Google just sw swipes up all the photos and all the video that people are taking with glass or just turns on the camera briefly, faces. Um, and with the GPS knows where those faces are. And maybe with facial recognition can identify those faces. And all of that can happen not only without the user's con uh, knowledge necessarily, but with the user's consent, at least implied consent, because of how vague the Google privacy disclosure is. There's very, very little information about what Google is using Glass to collect for itself. Um, in thinking about a privacy policy that the user would, would uh, provide to people around, I did come up with this. Uh, I will be putting it on a t-shirt or sweatshirt to wear with my glass. Um, and it's funny, but it really doesn't address the broader issue of all of us glass users as drones, literal and figurative, collecting information for Google. So let me give you a specific example of how hard it is to figure this out. This is a screen from what's called, I like the name, Glassware. This is the list, part of the list of applications that one can install on one's glass device through a website. So I'm going to focus on one of them. It's called Fanthy. Discover amazing stuff. Collect the things you love. Buy it all in one place. So if you decide to click on that little plus button and install Fancy, you're presented with this. Take your fancy experience with you on Google Glass. Experience the world around you like never before, OK? And then it's, at the bottom right of that window, it says there's a little off. And if you click on it, it starts installing. Now, there's nothing here about privacy. So OK, maybe I'll click on more info. And when you do that, though, this is what you're given. And actually, while you're installing it, Google asks for permission. The app wants to. Know your basic profile info and list of people in your circle, circles being a Google Plus thing. Allow people, allow Google to let these people in your circles know you've signed into this app. View basic information about your account. View and manage your glass timeline, which is what you see in the screen. But how do I know what the privacy policies are? We look down. It says, Fancy and Google will use this information in accordance with their respective terms of service and privacy policy. You know what those aren't? They're not links. It's just a sentence. So there is no way in installing this application, no way in the process, that you can find out the privacy implications, how much information is being collected by either Google or Fancy in order to install this application. The idea of informed consent is just simply not there. 
So not a new problem, but the particulars of glass, both of the interface, how users see it, and also what it can do uh, without any intervention potentially from the user, let alone the people around, raises some new issues. And it's not unique to Google. Any of these wearable technologies, there are now smart watches um, with cameras, any of those kind of things do raise these concerns. But to me, the difference is, is quantitative. Google has more channels of information feeding it. Phones, tablets, computers, uh, cars, GPS systems. If you use Waze, W-A-Z-E on your iPhone, that is a Google company now. They bought, Google bought it uh, as well. Um, glass devices, cars, their own cars, um, the Open Automotive Alliance, your thermostat. Google has more channels of information coming into it uh, or to do things with that information than I would argue most, if, all, if not all, governments. I think the NSA has less about us than does Google. I'm serious. Uh, which is why the NSA looks to surf Google servers to get more information. Um, it's just astonishing to me. Uh, and so what do you do about it? FTC enforcement, FTC power is limited here. The FTC, the idea of self-regulatory, it's tough. Um, they have to notice an, infr an infraction, decide it is a sufficiently bad one. They have sued Google. They've gotten consent degrees from Google. Google has so much cash, it's irrelevant. It is, it's not even a cost of doing business. Um, it's just not very effective in slowing, uh, let alone stopping, some of these practices or improving them. So in thinking about what there might be available, at least in this country, to require better disclosure, more complete disclosure, and have some consequences to this disclosure, I started focusing on the unique nature of wireless devices. Uh, wireless devices are subject, in addition to <laughs> general consumer safety and pricing and all the other things that any device in the marketplace might have. But because of the possibilities of interference with other wireless devices and the limitations on the electromagnetic spectrum, all wireless devices to be sold in this country and certainly in many other countries must get government certification first. They must go through specific testing regimes uh, in terms of signal and interference and power output and safety, uh, radiation. Uh, in the United States, that's done through the Federal Communications Commission. It has jurisdiction. And the FCC can approve or block a device from being sold on the marketplace based on its wireless communication justification. And so it occurred to me that passing a general privacy statute it's a challenge. It's a challenge in a lot of ways, um, whether it would work constitutionally, whether it would work from a from a, just a functional perspective. But we don't need any new law here. What we need, this would be a regulatory fix, a fairly manageable one um, for devices that are already undergoing FCC inspection. And the idea would be that in addition to the typical testing, the required testing currently for devices, and what you're seeing here is actually the FCC page for Google Glass. All of the submissions that, the, that Google made to the Federal Communications Commission in order to be permitted to sell Google Glass to the public. Um, so if you're looking at device AR, A4R-X1. Um, and you can see there are a lot of different things. So the idea would be <laughs> to add privacy disclosures, to add specific information not only about the signal strength and power, but how the manufacturer is using this to collect information and have that disclosure part of the FCC approval process. And not only the initial approval process, but require it to be reapproved on a regular basis. Require companies to resubmit 
for update information that was publicly available business practices related to consumer information. Um, it's a technical ability and it's a technical issue. And what doing it here would do, in the same way that adding a question about did you buy anything online and not pay use tax uh, did when they added it to the New York State tax returns, um, it adds an additional set of penalties and an additional set of procedures. No more is this just about figuring out if it's accurate. There is a federal obligation to file information about privacy. We don't see that now. Um, and it would allow people to make better informed decisions. Uh, it would allow real accountability and redress to the extent that it's discovered to be inaccurate, the same way that if Google or any other manufacturer is saying its device is radiating on this megahertz at this power level and it's actually not, you've got redress there. Um, and so there could be additional uh, updates, et cetera. Um, so that the idea, that's the idea of the piece. It is a prescriptive piece. I see your hand for a second. Give me a second, Meredith. Um, and well, I have, what I'm doing with the paper now, um, first of all, it's better informed by my own experience and access to more information about class. But given a, the different audience, um, looking to try to figure out the specific place within the FCC regulations, how it might be worded, et cetera, look more at some of the challenges. But um, I do think that this is really our only shot, and I think it's an important thing to put it forward to make to have companies that are building wearable devices, particularly those with so many data channels like Google, um, have them have more accountability, have more of a process of informing all relevant stakeholders of what they're doing, how they're using the information that these new sensor suites, these new sensors that they're promulgating uh, can provide. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Meredith. Nope. You're going to have to type again, I'm afraid. <laughs> And uh, while Meredith types, can you add a question as well? Yeah. Yes, Meredith, there you are. Oh, OK. I guess these heads don't work. All right. Um, thanks, Jonathan, for a, a great presentation. Uh, one thing I just, I don't know if you saw, I, I posted the link in the chat there. One thing I wanted to mention was there was a, an article in the New York Times this Sunday, uh, I think arguing, and I'm a neophyte on this stuff, but arguing at the Fourth Amendment uh, search and seizure rules should apply to companies. So if you haven't seen that, I, I think you might want to consider it. Other two comment. One's a comment. One's a question. So the the comment is to the extent it sounds like you're going towards disclosure here and mandatory disclosure. I would absolutely uh, recommend you read a piece by Omri Ben Shehar called "The Failure of Mandated Disclosure," and the argument in that article, which I think is very persuasive, especially in this type of consumer context, is it the mandated disclosures actually don't help consumers, but quite the opposite, um, often end up uh, lulling uh, into some complacency uh, because of what leads to what is now my question, um, the lack of any real consent in this context. And so I'm wondering whether if, how you address in the paper and whether you'll think about expanding to discuss what consent actually means and whether there's really any actual consent in this context. Well, I think, thank you, uh, and I, I would love to get a, uh, if you could send me offline, so to speak, uh, a link to that paper, I would like to see it, and hopefully if it, uh, you know, to the extent that it raises particular challenges, perhaps incorporate and even address it. Um, now, on the one hand, there's the idea of wearable devices from the user's perspective. There's more of an opportunity to consent than, say, with a website. Uh, because you have to make the choice of buying or not buying. Uh, and Google Glass at this point is a fairly significant purchase. So, and we see, we are given terms of, of service. Um, I think that, I would argue that people are really not consenting to other data collection by Google because of the ways, way it's happening. Um, but here at least you can indicate your consent through purchase 
or deciding not to purchase this device. Um, with websites, it is a lot harder. With non-websites like the apps uh, we see here, it is that much harder because you prove knowledge, let alone consent. But I think that having a more structured, formalized set of disclosures, one which ones which could really be audited, uh, would go a long way towards making at least possible the informed part of informed consent. Um, at this point, we're, we're, we're act we have so little available that um, you know I despair. And I'm not suggesting Google is doing anything evil, uh, but I am. But they have, as I said, they have a huge and growing set of data about us, categories that no one, no single company or government has ever known about us. Um, uh, Ken, do you still have a question? And we can't hear you. I don't know why. Are you muted? Oh, there we go. Jonathan? Uh, Jonathan? Oh, okay. Yes. Wait. Ken, uh, Ken and Meredith, we can hear you. Ken, we cannot. Uh, Marianne, you had a question while Ken types? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Are Perfectly clear. Perfectly clear. Yes. Um, you know, we've all gotten these privately disclosures. You get them from banks, you get them from credit cards, you get them from, you know, the insurance companies or whatever. But they're so dense, and the content of them is so, you know, um, convoluted, the, the way they're written, that for, you know, just about anyone, there are really virtually no significant or no meaningful disclosure at all. So I'm wondering. Um, you know, and most people, I certainly know I do, and I'm sure an awful lot of people just throw them away. It's just too, too um, impenetrable. So I'm wondering what um, what regulation there really needs to be about plain language or about um, you know uh, uh, something that a reasonable consumer would be able to understand about um, disclosure. Uh, it is. It is obviously. I shouldn't say obviously. Um, it's obvious if you're if one is in this world. Um, it's a very good thought, and it is one that people have tried to address again, both through law and technology. Uh, it, but the challenge with plain language disclosures in this context uh, is much the same as it is in other contexts. That it can be reducing the disclosure to meaninglessness. Some of these have to be sophisticated, or there's a lot of disclosure that has to happen. So even if the sentences are understandable, uh, you still can't force people to read it. But I guess what I'm looking at um, is this new category of devices. This new category, well, in a veil, in a barely fictionalized version, if you, uh, if any of you have read or are thinking about reading the new novel, uh, Dave Eggert's book, The Circle, uh, which is sort of Google the next generation and how scary it might be. Um, but there's a scene early in the book where the charismatic co-CEO of the company announces these tiny little lollipop, lollipop-sized cameras that are self-powering can be put anywhere, have wireless signals, and essentially turn the entire world into a video publicly accessible video surveillance uh, situation. Um, it's wonderful fiction, except that I'm walking around, not at the moment, with a camera. So the, the issue of plain language disclosure of people understanding is a very, very challenging one. And as Meredith points out in the comments, um, there's plenty of literature that says nobody bothers. Uh, people don't read it, etc. whether it's a privacy policy or a terms of use or any other contract. But at least those assume, and they are use, usable if only because the information at least is available. Um, and the FCC operates on the jurisdiction that the information must be accurate and available. And my argument is, it's not. It's generally not available when it comes to Google because of the complexity of the organization. But in, and there's not a lot you can do about it, or there are. But it would be a, a huge change to legislate across the board. But in this particular new category 
where we are all like those um, Google photo cars walking around, uh, I think that there's an opportunity to at least plant a flag to say you need, you already need permission to be selling these wireless devices. Here's more disclosure you need to do in a way that's publicly viewable. Um, it could be done perhaps in the securities context as well, another mandatory disclosure, but it's not logically placed there. I think here um, it does make sense. Hello, Michelle's daughter. <laughs> um, uh, can I show you my glasses? I actually have to admit they are downstairs. Um, there's a picture which I will, uh, which was taken by Kristen Grennan, um, and I'm happy to post that. It's a much better picture than it would show. Honestly, if I were wearing my glasses, my Google Glass now, it's really Google Glass, you have to get the terminology right, you wouldn't see anything. You'd basically see a little band above here and a tiny little prism, and that's really all that would come through. It is an, it's a remarkably subtle piece of equipment. Pure industrial design and even the, the uh, interface, very cool, very stable, um, but it raises a whole lot of issues. Um, so, uh, oops, sorry about that, folks. Mute, mute, mute. Um, uh, Deborah, you have uh, a question, I see. And oh, we see your, your hand is raised, Deborah, but I don't know that we can hear you. So, um, I'm not mute. There so you go. Okay. All right. So, can you hear me now? Absolutely. All right. So, I know I'm probably being very dense about this. But it seems to me that the privacy issues here are not, they don't implicate the purchaser as much as they implicate the world at large. What do you run into when you're wearing your glasses is someone whose privacy is being um, invaded. Isn't that right? So, um, what's the disclosure mechanism, not for the person who's purchasing, because we've talked about the density of the disclosures, but for the people whose car, I mean, the Google car thing, the Wi-Fi's that were being um, um, uh, spied on by the Google car, the people were being seen, or the people in a movie theater when the Google Glass is on. Right. In a sense, we don't have a, um, there isn't a very good uh, in advance consent requirement. And to a certain extent, our law doesn't require one. Um, you know, it's a, it's a long-standing principle that if you're out in public, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, whether that's a tourist with a camera or anything else, unless your image is going to be commercialized. I realize that's a very broad generalization. Um, and from a user to, you know, from an around you perspective, it's, it's not a whole lot different from someone with a cell phone, uh, a smartphone. I guess the, the, you're right that there's a real problem. And, and you know, I have my, my silly t-shirt, which is my effort to try to address it in at least a, a semi-amusing way. Um, but there's no mechanism of company collecting data to the world around you. But there is, I think, a real problem uh, of essentially turning the user, the wearer of glass, into uh, a Google photo car, into a Wi-Fi sensor, without necessarily knowing it, without being wanting to be part of that process. Uh, so that, for example, if I've got glass on, and someone were to come to me and say, "Are you, um, you know, are you adding my face to a to a facial recognition database, or are you uh, adding our wireless access point to to a map?" My answer to that is, "I'm not, but I don't know. I'd rather know and make a decision, and ideally be able to turn that on or off." To a certain extent, you can make those choices on a phone in a way you can't with glass, uh, but it is, again, you, you have to go where you have the opportunities. You don't have the opportunity other than for, through an advertising campaign for Google to 
let everybody know in the entire world all the information it's collecting. And you do have liability. Google has liability after the fact if it turns out it was deemed to be violating local privacy law. Uh, but for the people around me, Google doesn't have a business relationship with them. It doesn't have a conduit. It doesn't have the and the people don't necessarily have a business. You know, have the ability to to reach out to Google. Um, I, I use Google again because it is so much the archetype of this situation. It's far from unique. It just has so many fingers in so many places that I didn't even mention some of them. Um, you may have heard that Google is taking over from AT and T and providing. Uh, Google is building fiber optics. Serious um, businesses, but uh, it, I think both visceral and logic of our data-driven world. But at least here. Uh, as we move into a new category, maybe there's an opportunity to make a doable change that can at least improve overall knowledge for everyone, as well as specifically those who are making a decision to do business with this company or not. Uh, Meredith, I'm sorry, I have no, I, I couldn't figure out how to include the box lunches in the presentation, um, but I, I might have seen. Uh, email being delivered for you at a discount. Uh, are there other questions? I realize we are out of time, and some of you don't have to go teach today. Um, but I, I appreciate your your attention. And, oh, Hal has a question. Uh, I will try to to hear Hal, and if not, uh, I would ask ask that Hal type. Hal. Okay, Hal, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. So please type your question in the chat. Oh, Sam also has a question, apparently. And Meredith has raised her hand again. All right. Um, Okay, uh, I'm actually, I don't know if, if Hal was uh, able, if Hal, I'm happy, oh, he's trying to speak. It's not coming through, so if you'd be, be so kind uh, as to type your question. Is he muted? Okay. All right. Um, okay, uh, Hal, if, if you either... Why? I don't want to okay, Meredith, you had another point, question. But my question is about whether I can use this for makeup classes because this is this this is much. Right. So I was actually about. To, I, was actually about to, I was about to get to that. Um, let me uh, thank you all. Stop the recording, and then I'm happy to, to uh, talk a little bit about this platform. So um, let me do that and hold on. Stop. It.